Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. I'm very excited to do today's live stream on common things that most Christians don't know about the New Testament. And I'm thrilled to be joined again by Dr. Richard Carrier, who has a PhD Hello. from Columbia University. Uh, he specializes in uh, ancient history, specifically Greece and Rome, and has written many, many things on the Bible and Christianity. Welcome back, Dr. Carrier. Yeah, always glad to be on. So, I, as I understand it, um, before we kind of get stuck in, there is actually a Bible course that you're currently doing titled New Testament Studies for Everyone. Could you just mention yeah. a little bit about that to the audience? Yeah, I'm starting to um, port all of them. I used to do online courses. I still do. Uh, so I teach 10 courses online, uh, and they've been forum-based courses, uh, self-directed, study at your own pace, study as much or as little as you want, you know, that kind of thing. And the idea is to make them affordable and give you, like, the, the centering and the advice and stuff that you need to really introduce yourself to these subjects. And, and I have, if you go to my website, richardcarrier.info, right at the top is, like, take courses, and then you, that takes you to the list of the 10 that I'm doing. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm actually porting them over to myth vision into video courses. So like they started as this text based now they're video courses. And if you, if you go to and take their courses and more and more will end up over there. So right now it's this one that we're talking about, which is new Testament studies for everyone. And it's designed to basically give you all the basic skills that we scholars have that, that regular people don't know about usually to give you those basic set of skills so that you can actually dive into the scholarship and you can dive into look at the Greek and the Hebrew and things. And, and uh, you won't be an expert, but you'll be able to do things and see things and know things that most people don't. Uh, and so that's the idea. And to give you the basic idea of what, what is it that we actually know and assume is the case and it has been established in the field, which will not agree with what Christian apologists tell you uh, is is the case. So mainstream scholars have a very different idea about a lot of things uh, and have come to a lot of different conclusions based on the evidence. So the video course, so you get, it's basically uh, six to eight lectures. Um, you get lifetime, once you've registered for at the Myth Vision course, you, for the Myth Vision course, you get a lifetime access to the videos so you can rewatch them as often as you want. Um, some people like to just listen to them. Uh, I put a lot of visuals in my videos that are like relevant and not trivial. Uh, so sometimes you, you might want to watch the videos to see the displays and, and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> but then there's also there's uh, advice and bibliographies and uh, that kind of thing uh, that you can use the syllabus that you can use to dive deeper as much as you want, uh, including recommendations in the course text, whatever it is, each course has a different text. Uh, this one I teach from my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, which has a bunch of uh, peer-reviewed and other articles in it that are extremely useful for understanding how we do our job, uh, New Testament scholars. And so, yeah, so, uh, I, so I'm promoting that. I want people to, to take that. I want people to spread it around because uh, I want people to have these skills. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to, like, approach it and, and try and pick them up. It's wonderful how accessible this knowledge is, is becoming. And just so the audience knows, there is uh, a link in the description so that you can just click straight on the link and go straight to the course um, and yeah, get, get signed up on it. So you're, uh, you're so right that one of the things I teach in the course, I have a whole one of lecture on it and some practicals that, that are advised for people to take that they can learn it, is access to the original language is much more possible for the Bible than any other text that we have because so many resources have been put online. Uh, that, that are very, once you know about them, there's a lot you can do with them, even if you're not an expert. Uh, and so one of the courses, one of the lectures in this course is teaching people, first of all, that they exist, and then also like give you some basic ideas of how to use these online tools uh, to get behind the English, because the English translation, people always ask me like, what translation of the Bible do you recommend? And I say none of them. Uh, because they're all, they're all tendentious, they're all making decisions they're all concealing things that are in the original language that you won't know about. Uh, so there isn't really any one good Bible translation. Now, there are better and worse ones, but uh, not a, there's not a single Bible translation that is really literally reliable. Even the literal translations are not because literal translations conceal valences and meanings and stuff as well. So, mm. uh, so there's no, there is no ideal English translation. So if you want it, you've got to get back at the original words. Uh, and, and that's, you know, hard to do if you're not an expert. So there are tools that can help you get closer to that than you ever thought you could. 
absolutely so actually the um we're, we're currently doing a series on the channel uh looking into various doctored passages in the new world translation which probably of all the bad translations is is has got to be among the worst um <laughs> <laughs> because you know they have a clear agenda jehovah's witnesses in um you know kind of sanitizing the bible taking out the yeah. the more controversial things and uh, erasing any mention of of the trinity um right so, right so. Uh, and so uh we do a lot else too like there's a lot of doctrinal decisions and even like things that you can't necessarily even tie to to spe specific doctrine just the way they choose to translate things can conceal information that uh you will miss otherwise so yeah absolutely i think it's it's worth doing that going through and showing that as a case so once you know where that it's a reality mm. then you know you have to get behind it so you know doing the work that you do and obviously you've been involved now in you know a number of conversations with uh, peers who perhaps approach Bible scholarship from a theistic standpoint and indeed you know Bible apologists um, what would what would you think or, or what do you consider to be the most common misconceptions about the New Testament among Christians especially among Christians generally uh, is the fact that we're waiting for that cock to crow three times by oh, the way yes, but I'm carry on, on. <laughs> Rant, by the way, they have a lot of chickens. That's uh, okay. You might hear goats as well, so it's possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, third third crow. No, is there, there's no third. There'll be more than three. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, it's funny that you, yeah that comes across in the audio. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think the most common is that we don't really have a text. Like there's this assumption that Christians have that there's there's a text of the Bible. It's 100% reliable and accurate and established, and that's what we base everything on. But they don't realize is that all Bible translations, even the King James, but uh, especially uh, more recent Bible translations, are translating from what's called a reconstructed text, which is that scholars look at hundreds of manuscripts, which are filled with errors, and then they try using certain systematic methodologies to reconstruct the earliest version that we can get at, and so, and you know, they follow certain rules as to how do you, how do you decide which thing is an error, which thing is original, and so on. And so they reconstruct the text. And so you get the, for example, the Allen and Allen edition, which is the one that I recommend in the course that we're talking about, which has all the Greek. But then underneath it, it has what's called an apparatus. That's every page. You turn every page, and there's just tons of these where there's variant readings on the manuscripts, and they grade them. So they'll they'll grade the reading that you see in the main text that they've decided on. And it, it's A, B, C, D is, are the grades, right? Uh, anything below D doesn't get in, right? But, <laughs> but if you look and you see like there's a D grade for something, that means they're really, really not at all confident in what they've chosen to put in the text. And then they put the alternatives that they know about uh, in the apparatus so you can read them. And so this show, the people don't know this. That, so that's a reconstructed text. There's no manuscript in the world that has that text. And yet that's the text we're using to translate the Bible. Right, so the Bible is translated from a text that doesn't exist. Essentially, it's it's a hyper. When you say text. reconstructed text, I, I'm imagining. So, uh, you know, I've I've been to um, you know the the John Ryland's Library in Manchester, and I've been to I forget the name of it now, but there's um, a collection in uh, Dublin of of New Testament um, fragments. Right. Um, and when you say reconstructed, are you referring to the fact that you know a lot of the earliest um, uh, fragments that we have are, you know, fragments, and therefore you're having to kind of guess what the in between words are that uh, aren't haven't been preserved for us. Is that what you're talking about when you're talking about reconstructing? Not exactly, because we do have full Bibles, right? They start right. late, right? So like, we're talking fourth century and on by the time mm. we get full Bibles. But you take like the two oldest Bibles we have, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Um, they have tons of errors. Uh, so so the reconstructed text that we're using today doesn't agree with either of those Bibles, right? So we, we've gone in and looked at hundreds of manuscripts and decided what readings are more likely to be correct and put it in there. But there is no, you can't go find a codex or a Bible anywhere in antiquity or the Middle Ages that contains the text that we're using because we've built the text. It's, mm. it's scholars invented the text, essentially. They invented it based on like probability and logic and things. It's not just arbitrary. But, uh, but nonetheless, it is a text that doesn't exist anywhere. Like there's no manuscript that contains it. So you can't say, well, we're going to rely on the most, the oldest Bible. And it's like, well, then if you choose that, you're going to be choosing a Bible full of error. 
uh, that we know, we all agree, it's full of errors. Uh, so you can't use that. So there's no translations uh, generally that are based on any actual manuscript. It's all invented. Um, and like I said, invented for reasons, but still people don't know this. And they also don't know like how much error there is. Tremendous. And it was worse earlier on, which is a bigger problem because we, we know that uh, Christians in the first two or three centuries were not professionals. They were just average Joes copying these manuscripts. So the manuscripts are not professional scribal works. So they're filled with kind of amateur mistakes. Um, and they get professional later. So like late third century into the fourth century, we start seeing professional scribal work where they're using the skills they had at that time to like try and stabilize the text and to make more reliable error checking and things like that. Uh, there's still tons of errors after that, but there are more before that. And so but those, that's the period when we have the fewest manuscripts and thus the fewest pieces to actually build the text from. So the period in which there was the most error is the period in which we don't get to see most of what was written. Uh, and so by the time we get professional manuscripts, like I mentioned those two codexes, uh, by that time, like a lot of decisions have been made about what's going to go in there. And that's another thing. It's like a lot of the times these decisions are doctrinal, just like we were talking about the English translations are doctrinally motivated. Uh, there are a lot of interpolations, like things that they just decide to add or subtract or change. Uh, and there's more of those than most people know about. So if, a lot of people know that like, the long ending of Mark is an added thing. It wasn't in the earlier manuscripts of Mark. And there, there's different endings. So people, most people know there's the abrupt ending at verse 8, 16, 8, where the, the women run away and that's it. Uh, there's the short ending, which adds like a little verse that kind of wraps that up, uh, which is also an added ending. It didn't exist in the original. And then there's a long ending, which has this elaborate thing where Jesus talks about handling snakes and all of that stuff. Uh, that was added later. Well, there's actually two other endings of Mark that people don't know about. One of the endings that we have in various Bible manuscripts uh, has Jesus coming out of the tomb and ascending to heaven on a flight of angels. Uh, and then we have another one that inserts into the long ending this dis weird discourse that Jesus has on Satan. And so there's there's five different endings of Mark, and most people don't know most people don't know any that didn't realize that this is a thing at all. And even and that's significant because Mark is the earliest considered correct. to be the earliest of the gospels. Yeah, 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 this is a big deal, right? Uh, so the earliest gospel has been heavily meddled with. But so this shows that like they're doing this all the time; they're meddling with the text a lot, which means that there's going to be lots of instances where we're not going to know that they've meddled. Like we're lucky that we have the manuscripts that show what some of this meddling. But a lot of this meddling, we won't be that lucky. We won't have a manuscript that shows the meddling. So there's going to be a lot of hidden meddling that we don't know. And you can kind of calculate a, a rate. Uh, it's about like, um, I think it was like 20, 20 verses we should expect in the New Testament were interpolated and for which we will have no evidence and therefore won't know it. So mm -hmm. any verse you're looking at in, in the New Testament has like a 1 in 200 to 1 in 1, about 1 in 200 chance of not being in the original or 1 in, two, 1 in 1,000 at the worst, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's a probability that anything you're looking at is something that got added and we just didn't catch it. Uh, but we've caught a lot. So there's a lot of others that we have caught. And I think this is sort of the corruption and error proneness of the manuscripts and the fact that none of them agree with each other and that our version that we're using, the Greek that we're using today is reconstructed. It doesn't belong to any manuscript. I think that's the biggest thing that most Christians don't understand. And I think it kind of opens your eyes when you do realize that it's like, oh, this isn't really like a miraculously preserved text. This is another fallible, corrupt piece of propaganda just like anything else right indeed uh, what and when you're approaching uh, the you know the new testament with the knowledge that you've accumulated you know through your many years of, of studying this um let's take you know there's the gospels there's uh, acts of the apostles and then you get the uh, epistles you get the the letters of of uh, mostly paul and then and then various other um, apostles, uh, although Paul wasn't one of the twelve, and then you get sort of revelation. Um, which of these documents do you kind of read with the most incredulity in terms of you know this this is um, this is sort of less to be trusted, whereas this probably was written by the person who it's right. thought of to have been written by. Yeah. yeah, and that's another thing people often don't know. That half the letters of Paul in the New Testament are forgeries. That's the mainstream consensus. There's a lot mm -hmm. of good evidence establishing that he didn't write a lot of those letters. Uh, but others he did write. But another thing is, like, the ones he did write, the versions we have aren't the originals. 
mm. because they're pastiches of multiple letters, right? So they have multiple endings, they have pieces inserted, stuff has been pulled out. Uh, so it was like we, we had a dossier of shorter letters that people crammed together to make the letters that we have today. So there's a, been, been editing that's beyond our access. Uh, it, it doesn't exist in any manuscripts. It predates all manuscripts. Uh, and this is another thing I talk about in the course is that we now know that we can trace all manuscripts to an edition, a single New Testament edition that was published in the mid second century, mid to late second century. We have no manuscripts from any of the documents in the New Testament that predate that. So whatever editor, whatever changes that editor made are now going to be in all manuscripts. So we, we don't have any way to get behind the curtain of Oz on that to see what the documents looked like before they got collected into that edition. Uh, and so that's a big problem uh, for this kind of thing. But uh, what happens is the selection of which forgeries uh, to put in, right? And, uh, and then which pieces of letters to put in for, for the authentic letters. Uh, and so, and then of course, how do you date forgeries? Like that's hard to do. Uh, like we don't know when, because they're, they're fake. We don't know when they were written. Uh, we have guesses, decent estimates, but uh, generally, yeah. Yeah, you don't trust half the letters of Paul. And people can go on Wikipedia and there'll be lists of which letters are believed to be authentic and which ones aren't. People are interested in that. Uh, that that's interesting you should mention Wikipedia because I do kind of lean on it quite a bit um, just as a kind of, uh, you know, a, a quick point of reference. Yeah. Um, it it's came in very handy, actually, in my, in my early deconversion just to kind uh -huh. of get a, a brief kind of overview of of what scholars actually have to say on the, such things as Noah's flood and that kind of thing so it's interesting yeah, you should mention like, wikipedia is a roughly reliable point of yeah call. roughly like there's doctrinal meddling there's attempts to be neutral you know sort of faux neutrality and all of that uh, both mm. sides of them and things like that but you can the thing about wikipedia is they require citations so that you can actually breadcrumb everything and actually check like, well, which one of these disputed points is more likely to be true, et cetera. So Wikipedia is a good starting point for research. I, but some of it's like pretty good. Like the, there's a, what I, and one thing I recommend in the course is that there's a, a list of New Testament papyri where they have a complete list. And, and a lot of those papyri have specific Wikipedia pages about them. Uh, and so like you can really go into the manuscripts and see what actually was in them. And, and usually it's very little, because we have little tiny scraps, right? Let's say like a whole manuscript and it's like two sentences, right? Is all we have. Uh, like often when you hear Christians say a lot, we have hundreds of manuscripts from the early centuries. And it's like, you mean hundreds of little pieces. Which takes me, takes like, me to what I was saying earlier about yeah, the fragments. Right, right. You know, you're talking about yeah, like exactly. a little tiny little thing that's been found. Box. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so, but you can discover that yourself, right? You can actually deep dive it into Wikipedia. But there, there's a mm. New Testament papyri. Uh, and the papyri are all the earliest manuscripts. And then you get to codices, uh, that's Bibles, like, or, or whole books um, that are bound. Uh, and so those, that's a whole separate, there's a, there's another uh, thing on that as well. Uh, and then you get to the the medieval stuff. So there's a ton of, ton of medieval manuscripts that also have a lot of disagreements. Uh, fewer, but uh, still a lot. Um, and there's even things in the manuscripts that aren't in any of the versions that you see translated so there'll be like notes in the margins and stuff notes in the uh in between lines that can tell you all kinds of interesting information and so like how do you get to access to that stuff mm. uh is it, that's another thing i talk about in in this course is like how do you find out like that a particular medieval scribe mentioned that he saw a manuscript that didn't have this verse in it right oh, you know, wow. we have that manuscript yeah. we have someone saying it but you wouldn't know that if you didn't read the marginal notes in this medieval manuscript right so, so there's ways to get access to that um you have to do it through scholarship someone has to have written about it uh if you're if you're a lay person that's how you have to do it uh but there's ways to do it and you find out that stuff so um yeah that's that's the thing that i i, I think uh and i also have lost trust in the book of acts um i i I think that's a huge amount of propaganda revisionist history. Uh, I don't, I don't trust it as a source uh, historically. Uh, well, it contains lots of supernatural um, claims, doesn't it? About, you know, I mean, that's true yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. suspicious. Um, but uh, not just that. I think even just mundane things like the fact mm. that it completely contradicts Paul's own eyewitness account of his own travels and chronology, right? Like, it, it, almost deliberately, like it, 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 in fact, deliberately, I think it's it's rewriting Paul to create a smoother, happier, go lucky, unified church story than we get from Paul himself, right? And so uh, you won't know this if you don't compare. 
and you were, I think you might've been getting at the fact that despite the order of the books in the New Testament, the authentic letters of Paul are our earliest documents. So really the New Testament should start with those and then get to some other letters and then get to the gospels and then get to acts and then get to other, the forgeries and the other letters, right? So that like, if you put the New Testament in chronological order, you would get a very different picture of the development of the religion and its ideas and beliefs. Because it's almost like, you know, dipping into my kind of experience as a believer uh, and, and, and as well through the ordering of the New Testament, it's almost like, you know, the main things that we should be thinking about are the Gospels and everything else that's in there is just to kind of add weight to the Gospels. Right. But it sounds like what you're saying is that there are certain um, writings ascribed to Paul that we can have reasonable confidence were actually written by Paul and everything else is more or less a mess. And comes much later, like after yeah. this like lifetimes later like uh so um yeah all right i think like it, it changes your perspective on things um mm. and then you start to notice like all the stuff that isn't in paul right so there's like, like tons of stuff in the gospels and you wonder like wait a minute paul never mentioned any of that it was like yeah maybe because none of that stuff was being told back then it was that was all later mythology it wasn't earlier uh yeah so understanding the new testament does require understanding how do we date these things? How do we figure that out uh, as scholars? And and so that's one of the things I cover in the course as well. What, what, why do you think, and I understand, I don't want to spoil too much from the course, but why do you think there's such a huge kind of divergence almost between sort of the, um, I, I guess, what's considered to be kind of the sort of liberal approach that Jesus took in speaking to women and, um, you know, having a very relaxed view towards the the kind of letter of the law, and and Paul with his kind of pronouncements telling women to be silent in the in the church, and oh, and all this yeah. is almost like a huge contrast between this sort of more tolerant kind of character of Jesus and the um, yeah it's the draconian Paul way. narrative. This, this yeah. ties right into what we were just talking about about chronology and development and corruption of text. Mm. Um, and then oh, I use as an example in the course, um, the line in first Corinthians 14, where Paul says women should, should shut up in church. Um, it's also in first Timothy more blatantly in first Timothy of suffer, not a woman to like teach or have authority over a man. First Timothy is a forgery. So Paul didn't write it. Uh, it's probably a second century forgery. So it represents a hundred years later, the evolution of the church, the church is be becoming less egalitarian and more patriarchal and hierarchical again. Uh, it's kind of going back to the very thing that it was rebelling against originally. Uh, mm. And so you get, and that ends up being all modern Christianities are developed out of this sort of patriarchal, re-hierarchical version of it, rather than the sort of anarchist, communist, egalitarian version that's kind of started out. Um, and the line in, that one line in 1 Corinthians 14 is also an address. There's, there's good evidence to show that Paul never wrote that line. Someone made him say that. And in fact, in that same chapter, he talks about women talking in church. So clearly, that's that's something that he actually uh, argued. Um, Paul is still, you know, he's still got like a little bit of the sexism of his time. Like he's not, you know, a total woke person, but he's much more egalitarian than we get later Christianity promoting. So they mm. turn him into this misogynist later on, this sort of patriarchal misogynistic uh, male supremacist kind of thing. They, they invent that. Like that's not Paul. And so what you have the order is you have Paul's actually more egalitarian. And he even says like, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in the baptism and, and among, uh, in Christianity, there's neither male nor female nor slave nor free. Like we're all like supposed to be equals. And in particular, he's arguing like we're going to be equals after uh, the resurrection, right? Like, so that like all social distinctions will be eliminated. It's kind of, so this is a very anarchist point of view, right? Uh, egalitarian point of view. Now then you get Jesus and Jesus is, you know, people have different gospels have Jesus act different ways. He's more rules-based in Matthew than in Mark, for instance. Uh, Luke is trying to reconcile those two versions. Uh, but you're right. Like, you still see a little bit of this kind of counter-cultural, uh, counter-elite, um, soft-on-the-rules kind of attitude. Um, but then you get later Christianity, and that gets represented in the interpolated text of 1 Corinthians and in the forgery of 1 Timothy. And then you get the, the sort of misogynistic thing. So if you don't know how to look at the manuscripts and the manuscript history and the chronologies, you won't know that this is the story. You would think that this is just, Paul was always this particular, like Christianity was always anti-woman from the very beginning. And, and, and then you have to kind of like interpret Jesus in light of that. 
when it's the other way around, right? So you, you learn that actually it gets more misogynistic over time. It, it didn't start, start out that way. Sure. I, I also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of recollecting my own kind of journey of learning more about the Bible and, and kind of doing research on it um, because it's, it's fascinating how I'm learning more about the Bible now that I'm actually an atheist uh, than I ever knew yeah. as a believer. Uh, but it blew my mind when I read that um, someone described um, that, or, or it was expressed in a book that we know more about the writers of the Old Testament than we know about the writers of, of the New Testament. I don't know whether you'd agree <laughs> with that. And yeah, and also... That's true. Um, yeah. I mean, it depends on which books you're talking about, but the Old Testament is big, right? So there's a lot of books. Yeah. Um, but we have a lot of, and a lot of those are also interpolated and messed with as well. So like Isaiah mm. was not all written by Isaiah. Uh, yeah. For, but um, but you're right. We have a lot more that we can reconstruct uh, about them, especially since it's a lot of different writers who actually write about themselves. Like they actually yeah. say who they are and go on and talk. Like we don't we don't get that as much in the New Testament, except when they're lying. So like you know, First Timothy. Uh, or Second Peter is a good example. It's total forgery, but so you would think like, oh, we can know more about Peter by reading this letter. It's like, no, it's fake. It's, it's written maybe a hundred years later. It's not uh, by the original guy, mm -hmm. and so, which means we don't know who wrote Second Peter. We don't know what their design was. Like, we have to infer it from what they invent, right? Like, there's clearly some sort of propagandistic purpose for their inventing things. So we have to make inferences based on that. We just still don't know who they are, right? Sure. Uh, and and so that that's the main problem I think in the New Testament is. These writers either don't talk about themselves or are pretending to be someone else, uh, and and that's that's kind of the biggest problem with the New Testament. And, and what I find probably the most frustrating, particularly when I'm covering sort of Jehovah's Witness video propaganda where they're talking about the New Testament, is just this assumption that Matthew was written by Matthew, Mark was written by Mark, Luke right. was written by Luke, and John was written by John. And, you know, when you're a believer, you just, you know, that just makes total sense. But it's only when you start dipping into Bible scholarship that you realize that these are assigned yeah. names. And nowhere in these Gospels does it actually say, I'm Matthew and I'm writing this, you know. So that blew right. my mind when right. I or, or figured that out. Who they are. Like, like, right, would, would say, 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 yeah, say who they are and what they were doing and, and how they got the information they got like that but uh yeah this is one i do have a lecture on this in the course we're talking about where i talk about how do we know what you just said which is that how do we know these names were assigned and were not originally part of the gospels um there's a lot of converging evidence on that and the significance of it uh in, in the scholarly community we take it for granted but most people in the public don't know the answer to that question uh and so that's one thing i cover right is like how do we know that these aren't the original names Mm. Uh, of, of people much less like we don't even know anything about them because there are later legends about them we get like legends about who matthew was or who who mark was and stuff like that but the authors themselves never say any of that and and in fact the, the legends kind of contradict what the authors themselves do say uh so they're kind of like more like hopeful myths about who wrote the gospels rather than who actually did and so this is super frustrating uh for this field but it, it is the way it is it's the way the evidence uh, shakes out in this field well, all the more reason for people to learn more about Bible scholarship and this course that you're doing, New Testament Studies for Everyone, is surely a, a major step in that direction. So once again, uh, if anyone's interested in signing up for this course, there is a link in the description to this video. Um, but I wish you all the best with it, Dr. Carrier, and thank you so much for sharing what you've shared today yeah, on this live stream. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me on, and I always love talking about this stuff. So, uh, yeah, everybody, like, check out the course, uh, and more are to come. Absolutely, and hopefully we'll have you on the channel again soon. <laughs> so well, we're keeping it yeah. short and sweet, um, but thank you, Dr. Carrier, for joining. A quick shout-out to uh, Name Christian for your super chat, although I don't know what OHJ 2.0 stands for. Is that like oh, an inside? On my oh. book on the history of Jesus. Uh, second ah. edition. So a, a corrected edition, which just fixes typos and some minor errors, uh, is already out. Uh, so that's at least I got an email recently that my publisher says it's out. I'm in contract to produce a proper second edition that will address the responses to the book and, and things like that, reword some things to make arguments clearer and whatnot, uh, and then uh, update the bibliographies and stuff. So uh, yeah, second edition, the hopeful goal is for that to be out next year, probably near the end of the next year. Um, I'm, but I'm working on it this year. That's that's my major book project this year is to get the second edition of that completed. Fantastic. 
Well, well best of luck with that. Again, one, thanks again for joining me for this discussion. And uh, I'm really glad that you're doing this course. All the best of luck with it. Yeah, thanks. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Don't forget that you can watch more such conversations by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.